Pangong Tso is the highest saltwater lake in the world. Due to a geographical quirk of the Himalayan, it has no connection to the ocean. Rivers bring water, salt and minerals into the lake, but there's no outflow. So the water evaporates, leaving the minerals behind. Thanks to this, it has very little life in it and appears as clear as glass. On a clear day, it turns a stunning bright blue, perfectly reflecting the sky. In winter, it turns into a 700 square kilometer icy mirror. This isn't the only memorable thing about Pangong Tso. It's also the site of an absolutely wild amount of sword fighting. Throughout 2019 and 2020, this lake was the site of several violent clashes between two of the world's biggest armies, India and China. The Indian army filmed this footage as they attacked a Chinese armored truck. They thought it was getting too close to Indian territory. See, India and China share a very long border, much of it disputed, but mostly the border runs along the tops of mountain ridges. Pangong Lake is one of the few spots where it's actually accessible. They come face to face and, you know, they, they engage in arguments, they shout at each other, sometimes there are fisticuffs. Fisticuffs, yes, they punch on. They get in little motorboats and do like naval parades, they hold up little signs, they shout a lot. You'll notice that you're not hearing gunfire in these clips. That's because both sides agreed not to carry guns to try and stop it from escalating into a war. These strange little skirmishes were happening back in 2020 and you'd be forgiven for thinking that it's extremely unlikely that India and China could ever get along again. It escalated and escalated into diplomatic cold shoulders and boycotts and all sorts of unfriendly stuff. All of this was actually great for the US and its allies, particularly Australia and Japan. They capitalised on this tension to try and build an anti-China alliance with India on their team. <laughs> but now, four years on, things are starting to shift. Both India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Chinese President Xi Jinping appear to be looking for ways the two nations can be friends again. So what's changed between the world's two most populous countries? And what would a closer relationship between India and China mean for the rest of us? I'm Matt Bevan, and this is If You're Listening. China and India have been meeting at that very lake to duke it out for the last 60 years. And the first time it happened was all because India gave sanctuary to, of all people, the Dalai Lama. You see, the Dalai Lama was 23 at the time and had been the spiritual leader of Tibet since he was four, and the political leader of Tibet since he was 15. He'd spent his entire time as leader trying to convince the occupying Chinese government to stick to a promise. Communist China had promised to respect Tibet's religious institutions and its right to local self-rule. So leave us alone, please. China did not leave them alone. In 1959, they lay siege to the Tibetan capital and the Dalai Lama fled over the Himalayas to India. One month after fleeing his capital, eluding communist search parties in an arduous journey through Himalayan mountain passes, the Dalai Lama reached Indian soil. So now India was harboring the Dalai Lama, who was now openly critical of the Chinese regime. The 23-year-old God King restated his earlier denunciation of communist brutality in Tibet. China did not like this at all, and both sides sent soldiers up into the mountains to guard their vaguely defined shared border. In 1962, the two sides met at Pangong Tso, and as the crystal clear water began to freeze, the Chinese forces overran the Indian army. Another red crime against an unprepared nation. India didn't see this attack coming, and the mountainous terrain meant reinforcements would take days to arrive. Their massive columns armed to the teeth, overrunning 20 weakly defended frontier outposts. India was furious. Foreign aggression must be removed from our country, whether it takes one day, ten days, or a hundred days or longer, because it is our country. 
The foreign minister said this was a matter of sovereign integrity, not a matter of pride. We are not fighting to what the Chinese call save our faces. Sometimes people try to save their face by losing their heads. But China had marched several kilometres into Indian territory, basically just to show that they could. Then they declared a ceasefire and went home. India was humiliated. Thousands of their troops had been killed and they didn't have time to retaliate before China packed up their bags and marched back up the valley. But ever since, both sides have placed permanent outposts around the lake, just in case they find a new reason to start a war. When relations between the two sides are good, Pengong Lake is a nice place for a picnic. But when relations are bad... <laughs> For 60 years, the border has been a serious sore spot, all the way up until 2020. Remember those clashes that I mentioned earlier? Well, this time it wasn't over harbouring a god king, it was over a little road. In 2020, India was in the process of building an actual paved road from their airbase in the mountains all the way down to the nearest city, cutting the travel time from two days to six hours. That's good news for anyone who wants to pop up to Pangong Lake for a picnic, but China thought this was provocative and started building new access roads of their own. There were a number of literal punch-ups and shouting matches around Pangong Lake, but it was in the next valley north that things really got crazy. The Galwan River Valley looks like something out of a fantasy novel rather than a real place. It's basically like standing in a crack between two one kilometre high rock walls with freezing cold water rushing downstream at your feet. The only ground to walk on is covered in boulders which have fallen from above you. And across the river stands hundreds of men armed with big sticks, metal bars and riot shields. One day in 2020, after a lot of shouting and such, a brawl broke out. It went for six hours into the night in the rushing river, up the rock walls, and on the uneven boulder beaches. When morning came, dozens were dead on both sides, drowned in the river, clubbed to death, or thrown off the rock walls. I think it's fair to say that Indian media went absolutely bonkers about this. An Indian army colonel and two Jawans martyred, protecting India's sovereignty against the insanity of the Chinese aggression. The Chinese brutes were armed with iron rods and nails to attack Indian troops. Till our last breath, every Indian will defend India in the best capacity that he can. The Indian government was furious, cutting off China's supply of birthday wishes. The Indian Prime Minister did not wish the Chinese President Xi Jinping on his birthday, which was yesterday. And the Indian Opposition Congress Party was accused of not being anti-China enough. Is the bond that you share through this MOU with China stronger than your love for the country? Please tell us. This continued for weeks. Relations between China and India seemed to be pretty much toast. That sucked for anyone wanting to capitalise on trade between the two most populous countries on Earth. But to the West, it seemed like an incredible opportunity. Namaste. Good morning, Konnichiwa, and from Australia, good day. Within a year of the clash at Galwan River, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi was participating in a meeting with the leaders of Australia, the US and Japan. A late night meeting and a new dawn for the Quad. While the Quad Alliance had existed for a long time, leaders had never been involved before. We are united by our democratic values. Free and open Indo-Pacific is essential to each of our futures. They were talking about democracy and freedom, but the true meaning of this new Quad meeting was clear, to China at least. China has always been hostile to the Quad, seeing it as a US-led plot to contain it. But it's not that at all, wink wink. The Quad group of democracies, Australia, Japan, India and the United States, aims to counter expanding autocracies. The US, Japan and Australia are long-time military and diplomatic allies, and they were very enthusiastic about bringing India into the tent. The four countries began doing military exercises together and having regular meetings. At the time, all four of the Quad countries were on the outs with China. The US was engaged in a trade war with them. Australian exports had been sanctioned by them after the government criticised China's human rights record, handling of COVID-19 and military expansion. 
Japan was getting the cold shoulder over their support for Taiwan. None of it was quite at the level of beating people with iron bars in a mountain crevasse, but they all had friction. But then, last year, something changed. We've talked before about a number of unexpected shifts in Chinese domestic and foreign policy in the last year. China dropped its sanctions on Australian goods like beef, coal and wine and started returning the Australian government's calls. They increased their trade with Japan and the US and they agreed to send pandas to the US and Australia, as you might remember. We did an episode on that at the time. We believe Xi Jinping is looking to focus on domestic economic challenges and minimise the turbulence in China diplomatic relationships. And after years of blowing off in-person meetings, Xi Jinping flew to South Africa to attend the BRICS Summit, a multinational organisation made up of Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. BRICS. Get it? Prime Minister Modi could meet President Xi Jinping of China on the sidelines of the BRICS Summit. They're likely to discuss the border standoff. Indian media saw this as a big deal. This is a big deal. See? This change of attitude towards the rest of the world appears to come back to China's economy being unexpectedly in quite a bit of trouble. China's property sector is in not just disarray, but in complete meltdown. China's weak economic recovery is also worrying the Reserve Bank governor. On lots and lots of different measures, the Chinese economy is faltering. Xi Jinping has been looking desperately for ways to turn this around, and one of these ways appears to be a vigorous attempt to re-engage with India. New Delhi is opening doors to Chinese investors again. The border situation should not affect the normal development of relations between the two countries. This month, the Indian foreign minister said that the border dispute was on the way to being resolved. You can say about 75% of the disengagement problems are sorted out. Right now, there's a bit of a tug of war going on between the West and China over India. Next month, the BRICS countries are meeting again in Russia, where Xi Jinping will want to pull India closer to his and Russian President Vladimir Putin's idea of a multipolar world, not dominated by the United States. And last weekend, after missing a couple of meetings, Narendra Modi flew to Delaware to see Joe Biden and Anthony Albanese for a quad meeting. The quad is here to stay, I believe. Here to stay. A detente between India and China would probably be a good thing. I'm strongly of the opinion that people shouldn't kill each other with iron bars in mountain valleys. But an alliance between these two countries wouldn't only mean an end to lakeside sword fights. If the two largest countries on Earth could find a way to get along, they could combine to wield significant influence over the global economy and global politics. The next six months may be pivotal in figuring out if India is happier hanging out with the West or with China. <laughs>